And yeah, isn't that great? So we have to really recognize St. Ed's for being such great hosts through all these years. And this year, our sponsors, we always need to thank our sponsors, Visa, Events, Fable, Barrier Break, and of course, our friends at IAAP who are here on site for the whole week. So stop by and talk to them. And uh, how many of you came to the talk last night with John Slayton? Yes, John Slayton's brother, Peter, gave a great opening keynote, and it's all captured on video. So if you missed that, you should see it. It, it was pretty remarkable. And the uh, I think my favorite moment was when the lights went out and all of us sighted people in the room were just, you know, like, oh, hey, what happened? And Peter just kept on talking. <laughs> it was pretty great. So today, this morning, I am so excited. I mean, I told, talked about 20 years and the people who've been here for a while, but we have a new leader among us who is just so exciting to me. Um, we, we work a lot with a company called Remarkable Tech. They're a, a group that really focuses on technology for people with disabilities, and they run a, a podcast series. And I listen fairly often. And when I heard Giselle on that on that podcast, I just thought, I have got to get this woman to come to access you. So I, uh, I, I invited her and I'm really, really so thrilled. I got to spend some time with her yesterday and a few times on the phone. She is an amazing woman, um, self-described Afro-Latina, Dominican, dyslexic. She's also a TEDx speaker, top 100 future of work leaders. And at ADP, she is their chief product inclusion officer. But uh, she's really here today to talk about her project, which is the Nifty Collective. And I've said enough, I think, and I'm going to let Giselle just come and tell us all about it. Thank you all for being here. Hello to the brave people who woke up early this morning. What's up? Yes, as you heard, Cher, my name is Giselle Mota. Uh, for those of you who can't see me at the moment, I am kind of medium stature, uh, black woman, with brown skin, a big brown uh, and black curly hair. I'm currently wearing a, a jean jacket with some pretty nifty, if I do say so myself, uh, green pants. <laughs> And so here I am today just to present to you about being intentional when we innovate. And I want to talk to you about uh, an area of emerging technology that is called metaverse. Uh, have got, raise your hand if you've heard these, these terms, right? So metaverse, extended reality, so mixed reality as well. So augmented reality, AI, uh, virtual reality, and all of these things coming together. Now, Nifty Collective is a project where I'll be talking to you today about what it is, why we did it, why it exists today, and why intentional inclusion is so important when it comes to people with disabilities in spaces like this. So this entire project that we created was all about being rebellious. That is truly the intention of this project. Yes, Greg, look, I love that. We got a fellow fellow re rebels in here. So the point is, is that there was a space in which, you know, I forgot my little clicker. I'll get it if I, if I may. And so this is all about a space that was not designed originally with people with disabilities in mind. And so when we saw that, we wanted to make a difference and we wanted to change that. We've been working with technology companies and I'm gonna give you all the stories and, and tell you all the things. But really this week, I'm also here to learn. So as I share with you, I would love for you to kind of soak it in. When we have chances for dialogue and interaction, I'd love for you to ask questions and to help challenge so that we can take it back to these platform providers and keep pushing this and saying that we need to make changes in these spaces. Are we good with that? All right, good. So we're gonna be going back and forth. All right, so are we still working on, on some of the things here? Just the caption. Is the captions. All right. So Nifty Collective, what is it, Giselle? So Nifty Collective, NFTY Collective, is all about real people with disabilities around the world. And these disabilities, uh, some of them are seen, some of them are unseen. And there's also people with just physical differences in how they represent. And we wanted to make sure that we connected with them and we represented them in these spaces. So what you see on the screen right now is an example of uh, an individual. He's in a wheelchair. He has cerebral uh, or he has muscular dystrophy. He lives in Singapore. He is a rapper. 
and uh, he's been on many stages. He did something with uh, Katy Perry recently, uh, and he has slowly been declining in his muscular ability to be able to do things, and, and, but he's an amazing individual. And we wanted to show him and have an avatar of him, as you see right next to him, is an avatar of him, just as he is, with his little beanie on, his the sunglasses, his little rip in his jeans, and he's in his wheelchair there. And we showed on purpose, and this is the things that I want to, to make note of, we showed on purpose in his avatar form where his, his muscles and his makeup are a little thinner because that's how he is, right? His, his extremities are a little bit uh, kind of curved into themselves and that's how it is. And we wanted to show it and still make him look cool with these avatars. In the middle, there's this individual named Aubrey or Aubrey Blanchard. She's from Australia. She identifies as non-binary. She has uh, bipolar. Uh, and she, we wanted to represent these characters in our experiences as well. So people who have all kinds of differences, she has some purple, some pink hair as she appears out here in the world, and we wanted to represent that. And then on the other side, we have uh, Isaac Harvey, who you'll probably see quite a bit. You like Isaac Harvey? Yes, I love him too. And he's been a figure in LinkedIn uh, as an advocate for disability. He was born with hypoplasia, meaning that he has no arms and no legs. The feet that he does have are inverted into each other and he basically all, all, always exposes his feet or he wears socks. Uh, and we wanted to show him as well in that way. And so this is all about being intentional and saying, you know what, there are spaces such as Sandbox, which is a platform on the metaverse, which we'll get into in a moment. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna describe all these terms just in case. And uh, so gaming, if your children or nephews or nieces or whomever, maybe even you play Minecraft, you get on sandbox and play the games and go to virtual concerts and events or whatever these things are. But these are experiences that exist today. The avatars are not like this. And so what we're doing is inserting this on purpose and saying, we can have avatars that look like this. They can be amazing. They can be extraordinary and we should represent them. And so what you see in glasses, I'm just gonna give you a kind of a quick preview. What you're seeing in glasses is like this abstract image on the lenses. People who have those in our character set, that's indicative of a neurodiversity or something's different with them. I have a character and my character wears those glasses like that because I have dyslexia. And then there's other characters with maybe mental health um, or all kinds of things that you can think of that you can't see, chronic illness that you might not be able to see all represented in that way. So we decided to keep our characters looking cool. They're urban. <laughs> and one story I'll share with you briefly. Uh, last year, we were invited to one of the largest tech conferences in Europe called Viva Tech. It's a conference where Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, many other people with their technologies have always been present and talking about what's latest and greatest. Well, for the first time, we were invited there through Nifty Collective. And what happened is that we had our characters present. Thank you to my, my the interpreter here, I appreciate you. And we had our characters uh, there present. So when an individual went up to this sign in Paris, France at Viva Tech, at this tech conference where they're talking about all these things, they were able to take out their mobile device, put it up to the signage and see our characters pop out in augmented reality. And they were able to take selfies with it and interact and have those experiences. So there we were intentionally, rebelliously showing that in a space where we're talking about the metaverse and you know, extended realities and all of these things that we are there present as well, representing people with disabilities. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is just a quick video we did uh, last year, July time, uh, it, just celebrating disabilities and I want you to see some of the characters and the people who represent them and kind of what they say and I'll I'll describe it as well in just a moment. Do I have to point towards my computer? Hmm. Let's see how this works. The other one? I'll get you're my you're my clicker now. You're gonna be my clicker. So we'll go to the next one and show you a video here where we have our characters and their avatars next to them. And I will say so again, here's Isaac Harvey. Isaac Harvey, again, if you cannot see, is an Af he's a, is a black individual. Uh, he's in a wheelchair with no arms and no legs. On the screen right now, we're, we're showing a quote from Isaac where he's basically saying that what it means to him to be a part of Nifty Collective and how representation needs to catch up in these spaces. 
Brandon Farbstein has dwarfism and he's also represented in our character sets. He's a part of our collective. Uh, Aubrey Blanchard as well, who I mentioned with her pink hair and love the glasses because it's representing bipolar. In her case, we have people who are deaf, blind. Uh, we have people with ADHD, Asperger's, autism. We have people of all sorts. And then this last part that you're seeing on the screen are just some, that was Viva Tech in the middle where people are passing by and then our character is there. And then there's a game uh, experience in the metaverse where our characters are there. And then we have Brandon waving at the screen at everyone here. He's waving with dwarfism next to his mobility device that he uses a Segway, which I think he's awesome to be doing that. He gets around in his Segway and does that. And this is Nifty Collective. All right, so let me get into a little bit more detail. Great. So emerging technology, what is this Web3 metaverse? I'm sure you've heard horror stories about all of these things. Raise your hand if you have heard discriminatory, biased, cringy stories about metaverse, Web3, VR, all the things, right? Yes, it is a fact that that exists. I will share with you that in one of the spaces in which we actually had on the screen where we built a metaverse space where our characters are on display and you can interact with them. There is actually, and I'm, by the way, spoiler alert, I'm gonna say some things that are a little cringy. Okay, so just because we have to speak about the good and the bad at the same time, and I'm just gonna share the reality of what's going on. So in one of those spaces, there was a group, a neo-Nazi group who was in there and in the metaverse space and having people gather together with their avatars in a space. To, and it said, we hate, it said something around like, we hate, all black people and this and that, the other and LGBTQ plus, whatever it was that they felt like they wanted to, to do. But these spaces have the potential to be used for harm, right? They have definitely have the potential to do that. But so does everything else, if you think about it. Our augmented reality or AI and all these things, they have the ability to be used for bad, but they also have the ability to be used for good. Because in these same spaces, we also now have people gathering with disabilities able to see things like our avatars in these spaces and interact with that and have that representation and inclusion where people are gathering from all around the world and highlighting and coming together virtually in those kind of immersive spaces from their home or from wherever they're tuning in on with disabilities and being able to be a part of that as well. So there is good and there is bad and I will share with you as we move along. But let's define some of this as we, as we go forward. So I want to give you a quick 101, just in case if you don't even, if you're like, what is all of this, Giselle? Sounds great. What is it? So let's let's talk about the foundation of what builds this. So blockchain. Have you heard of blockchain? All right. Do you know? Are you like, what's blockchain though? I heard of it, but I don't know. Right. Okay, good. So blockchain is, I'm going to give you the 101 version Giselle style. And that is this. It's a decentralized system of truth. And a lot of times, for example, you will have a middle person who is basically like if you have a transaction between a few people, right, yourself and the bank or whatever, you have a middle person saying, this is Giselle's account, or in fact, Giselle did get this qualification or this certification, and thus we say, uh, we approve, it is correct, she's not lying on her resume or her application, <laughs> this is correct. With blockchain, it's all about being able to say, to point back to the individual with a series of chains of, of blocks and say this individual actually does own this asset. This individual actually did create this artwork. This song belongs to them. They did indeed take that class or that certification because it will always point back to that individual. And that's blockchain. So it's taking out the middle person and saying, Giselle uh, is that person to go to to verify that this is indeed the source of truth. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of these tools and that we're talking about and these technologies were built on that kind of a system. And we'll get into that in a bit. I hope I'm not getting too geeky with you. Are you with me still? All right. Okay, cool, cool. So Web3, what is it? So let's talk about what that is briefly. So there's three iterations of Web. And so the first one was Web1, which we all know about. Basic web pages, HTML, e-commerce, Java, all these things were, you know, we all know that even in those cases, there was a lot of inaccessibility, right? And we're still trying to figure out what we're doing, even in web two, in the meet, in the era of social media, in the era of you're able to go online and post something up. However, the difference 
between web one, web two, and now where we are at web three is that remember that every time you upload something and you put it out there, it's not yours. Really, if you read the fine print and you know, honestly, this other company is monetizing off of your data and your information, they're selling it to third parties. In many cases, they're tracking you. You can't monetize off of what you put out there, but yet they, they do, right? And so this is a switch that has happened with Web3. Remember we talked about blockchain, which remember, but okay, let's go back real, real quick. So blockchain is that decentralized system of truth that points back to you as the original owner. So now on Web3, this whole concept has come out where if you now upload a video or your image, it goes back and says it belongs to you. So if that image makes money, if you know you you want to trade it, you want to whatever you want to do with that, a song that you create and upload digitally, it will come back to you as the original owner and you can monetize off of it and all of that happens in there. So that's the concept of web3. And so I would say it's a decentralized next iteration of the internet. And in that we see all these things like these buzzwords, NFTs, VR, AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, we hear about all the things that's that are in these spaces and metaverse as well. Still with me? All right, we in class, you know, we might as well. We're at St. Edwards, so we're just going to take a little class. All right, so now I want to tell you quickly about NFTs. By the way, in our project, what we did with our characters is that we've not only wanted to make these art representations of characters that you can look at and say, oh, what a cool looking character, which is great. We wanted to utilize them in as many ways as possible, meaning we're going to, and we're doing it already, we've created filters, games, AR experiences, VR experiences. We've done an art gallery with a partnership with Adobe, which we've gone in and are making that accessible as well on purpose so that when you go in, you could see our characters in augmented reality. You can scan and see them kind of like if they're on the stage with you. You can explore this gallery from your home as if you were there in person and you'll see our characters there. But we wanna make sure that even if you're not sighted, right, you can still enjoy it with the data and the meta descriptions and everything that we're putting in there and audio experiences as well throughout the way. So NFTs. One of the things that we did with our characters is for each of those people that I showed you, we gifted them their characters in a form of a non-fungible token or an NFT. Why did we do it? Because we're being rebellious. That's why, that's all we wanted to do. We're like, look, NFTs were out here showing like pictures of cats and selling for crazy amounts of money. Y'all remember this stuff and you were what? Like what's happening? We're like, what's going on? So we're like, you know what? We wanna be rebellious and we wanna create people with disabilities in these spaces. And if they wanna create their own line of NFTs and monetize off of them, then we're gonna enable them, empower them to do it. And we did. And so that's something that we did. And I will tell you something. If you're like, oh, NFTs, that's just, it's just another buzz thing. Let me tell you that people with autism and all kinds of neurodiversities or people from home with chronic illnesses and all kinds of things, have actually gone and created all sorts of digital content. And they are creatives doing amazing artwork that have been featured with Google and other companies as well and sold as NFTs. And, and so even in these spaces when you're like, oh, this is just another buzzword, this is another term, this is, even in those spaces, if we are intentional with innovation and we are intentional with representation and how we, consider accessibility and all of these things, people can actually get really good opportunities. People with disabilities can get really good opportunities to monetize, to have their own businesses, to do things, and they have. So again, I don't know if you're aware of that, but I wanted to share with you that even if you have a kind of a reaction to some of these things, there are spaces like leave room for the consideration of, hey, maybe this can be used for good because it is being used for good. All right, so NFTs, decentralized assets that enable a creator economy. What does that mean? That means that a bunch of big brands from real estate to fashion, to music, to the NFL who has created an NFT digital pass that gives you VIP access to different experiences if you hold it. Um, all of these things were created across various industries and this is real. Does anyone own an NFT in here, by the way? 
Got one hand in here, and it's my friend who's the geeky. The geeky. What did you do? You own an NFT? I felt like I saw a hand over here. Okay. Well, all of the people who have disabilities in our space that were a part of this uh, collective, they now own an NFT as well of themselves. And if they want to do more with that, if we have uh, musicians and athletes and uh, all kinds of things, so we have a Paralympian in who's who's training right now for the next games and uh he's a u.s paralympian and we have a musician who has been grammy nominated and she's doing amazing things we have so many different people as part of our collective if they want to upload some of their things you know a limited edition uh olympian token or something that they want to put out there or a music like a, a piece of music or something exclusive to her community she can share that around the world, monetize off of it through something like this, being a person with a disability. All right, here's one other term. I think I'm almost done with my terms. So then we'll get off of class mode and I'll share some cool things with you in a minute. Metaverse, what is that? So let me tell you, I love to simplify things. I think that, I think that sometimes we get all lost in terms and we forget about what we're talking about. So again, to me, kids have been on these things way before it became popular. Seriously, children were playing games in virtual spaces and they were creating worlds in their little games and they were having to use things like digital currency. Mom, can I buy this sword? Can I can I get this hat? Can I do this? And, you know, all of that stuff without, you know, it was digital currency and all of that was happening inside of a play world. And now it's become this whole industry that a bunch of brands have flocked to. And it's set in the in a couple, just a couple more years, it's set to be a multi-billion dollar industry. And we'll talk about that in a second, about how big brands have flocked to this world called the metaverse. But this is not only a children's thing. How many of you like and watch animated films? Of any type, right? So all of the things that were happening in there, especially during the pandemic, many films were created entirely with a green screen and with just animations, haptics, where you're able to wear gloves or it's screening your face and your, your movements, like the first avatar from over 10 years ago. Remember that, right? So all of these things were in film, in media, in gaming, but then they were made popular with this term of metaverse all of a sudden and everybody was like, oh my God, the metaverse, no. it's a whole thing but it existed already. And now what the metaverse is, is a combination of augmented reality, virtual reality, AI, and all of these features come together to create virtual experiences. So to give you quick examples, I think like Justin Bieber and a few other people, I think Lizzo and a few others, they have had concerts virtually in the metaverse. And people do things like uh, comedy shows, or they'll do uh, a display of their products, or people will come together and work in those spaces or socialize in those types of spaces where it's the representation of you in your avatar form, being able to enjoy virtual experiences. You do not need to wear virtual reality goggles to access every metaverse. Sometimes you could just use it from your mobile device and you're being able to kind of scan around it and, and uh, experience those things. And the metaverse is just this combination wheel that you see here. This is from Gartner. It is in online shopping. It's in the workplace. It is in, you know, using digital humans. It's in gaming. It's in all of these things come together to create what is called the metaverse. The company Accenture now onboards all of its employees through the metaverse. So when you go on there as a company, like you're new to, to Accenture, you'll be assigned an avatar that you can customize. You go into this space and maybe you're meeting your colleagues in China, in, I don't know, Hawaii, like you're all over the place meeting people and you can actually literally work on things together in a virtual space. And I've tried some of these solutions as well where you can actually work together with people there. So imagine if you were all supposed to be working on an engine or the design of a backpack or a sneaker and you were all together and being able to move this thing around digitally, you see it in 3D, you see it in all of its dimensions, you're able maybe adding nodes that understand like with, with analytics, I don't wanna to get too geeky, but with like AI and analytics is able to say, hey, if you move this piece, cause if it, if it shuts down, if it malfunctions, this is where it's gonna affect another part of this, those kind of things are done in these spaces. And this is real and happening in organizations today in case you didn't know. Are y'all surprised or are you like, I know, I knew this was happening. 
All right. So, okay, Giselle, this sounds all good, but how are organizations using all of this? So thank you for asking. I'm about to tell you. All right. So in a lot of ways, Barbados was the first government uh, that created a embassy, a virtual version of their embassy in the metaverse. And uh, this has expanded to others as well. And what this means is that people are able to go get their questions answered. So think about customer service, right? Relations and being able to have experiences, but you don't have to leave and actually get into a line in, in a queue and, and do all the things. You can actually interact and get the information you need in a more immersive way, if you'd like, from the comfort of your home. Yep, that's Barbados. UPS also did some deliveries in the metaverse. JP Morgan and Chain or Chase has opened up a, a branch in the metaverse as well. So this is one of my favorite uh, examples is Subway restaurants. Yeah, y'all. Have you ever tasted a virtual Subway? <laughs> so Subway went into the metaverse and they actually had an individual. This sounds corny, but it's, it's listen, looks, listen to the opportunity. So Subway went in and created this version of like, if you want to interact with them as a brand, this is all about branding and marketing. Let me highlight that. This is all about branding and marketing for the most part. And in a time during the pandemic where a lot of people weren't able or feeling safe to kind of go physically to a location and be able to experience something, imagine if you love sneakers. Are there any sneaker heads in the room? Like you love Nikes and all that stuff? Okay, again, that's saved two people for earlier. Y'all, you geeks. I love you though. <laughs> all right, and then somebody at the back. So if you love collecting sneakers, if you love whatever it is that you enjoy doing, Imagine that you can't go to the store, but you still want to interact with one of your favorite brands. So during the pandemic, cut in, these organizations got wise and they're like, huh, how do we engage our people virtually and immersively? How do we still get with them, get them the information that they need if, they're, if it's the government of Barbados? How do we deliver things to people in different ways without you know, needing to, to interact with them physically, UPS and others? You create worlds that are virtual and immersive and you can still enjoy experiences. So that's what this was all about. I had to highlight that. Okay, so these are all the different ways in which, and look at the screen for all these companies who have come up with one way or another to engage with their customers in the metaverse. This is real, it's not folklore. This is, this is definitely millions of dollars have been going, gone into brands to try to come up with these type of solutions and, and it works. The problem is that it hasn't really been based in, did I lose my uh, clicker again? It hasn't really been based in accessibility and it hasn't been representative of people with disabilities. And thus, that's why we created our project as well. I don't know, okay. How did you get into, well, thank you. Man. How did you get into these emerging technologies? Let me tell you. All right, so you can stay there, I think, because I, I don't know if my clicker is being unresponsive, so. oh. There it is. All right. So I've been personally been advocating for disability inclusion for a while now. So I told you myself, I have dyslexia. When I was growing up, I, I was raised in a household of immigrants uh, from the Dominican Republic and they spoke Spanish and I had dyslexia. And I was like, <laughs> I was trying to learn both languages at the same time. So for a while, I was very nonverbal. I, it took me a, a long time to, to speak. I would speak like the Tasmanian devil character, which would be just like, and like sounds and all kinds of things. And I, that's how I would do. Everything I did was backwards. I thought that I was dumb um, because it was very hard for me to retain information. Uh, and I looked around at my siblings and they were just excelling without trying. And I was struggling at everything that I did. And it took, it, was, it wasn't until there was a teacher who personalized her attention and said, Giselle, I think that there's something that's really, like you have a really keen ability to, to recognize patterns and you're good at math and you have a very scientific mind. And she sat with me and she started to take what I was good at and personalize my education to teach me how to do the things that I was failing at. So with reading and writing, for example, woo, it was difficult. And, and she taught me like, Giselle, if you see things in the form of like, equations and patterns, look at writing a paper the same way. Look, you're gonna start off with a main idea, one. You're gonna break it down into three topical areas and this is the type of paper you're gonna write. And then she just kind of took me through that and I began to learn based on my strengths. So quick highlight moment here, whatever you're good at or whatever you see someone else good at, right? 
tap into that area because it's going to help influence every every other area as well. And I like to tell that to people. But I've been advocating for disability inclusion for a while with our Project Nifty Collective and in different spaces. We've been featured on Vogue magazine, on PC magazine. We've done several podcasts and interviews. We've got in Forbes and Yahoo News, and we've done all kinds of things and been on platforms. And like you heard, I did a TEDx talk talking about the intersection of disability and the promise of being able to use AI for good. And how do you use technology to help people and personalize their experiences like learning? And so these are the things that we've been advocating for a while with the pandemic and everything that was happening with racial tensions and, and all kinds of things. I took a step back and I asked myself like, how was I using my time? And one of the things was I wanted to advocate even deeper for people with disabilities to show up in the space of technology that's leaving them behind. Because the pace of technology continues to move forward, but it leaves people behind. And I wanted to take this with us and be intentional about it, so I created Nifty Collective. So on the screen right now, digital identities. We have Snoop Dogg, the rapper from California, right? <laughs> so he, he, this is his avatar, which is available in the sandbox. In the sandbox, he has music videos, he has a whole mansion and people go in there and they play games and they can take on the digital identity of Snoop Dogg. If you want, you can be what's in the middle. It's like a sheep looking monster thing. It's voxelated, uh, which means that these are kind of blocky images and they're 3D. And you can be that if you want to. What you could not be was if you were born like Isaac Harvey and you do not have arms and legs and you still wanted to show up in these spaces, that didn't exist. So that's why we created that. And so we took on the same voxelated image and uh, the personas and the characterization of what you would see in Minecraft and Sandbox and Roblox and all of these type of things. And we created these avatars. Uh, and so all this is about creating this unhidden concept. And you would say, well, why do we need to, you know, some people would say, well, why do you, why would you want to show someone like that, right? In who, however they are. Um, one of our characters is an acid attack victim in India and her face is disfigured. She's, but she is still a gorgeous uh, woman. She is a person of power and influence. She's doing amazing things for other acid attack victims in India. And we highlighted her as a character. And she doesn't look scary. It, it, we didn't make it like a monster. We didn't make it anything. It definitely looks like someone who has a disfigurement in their face, right? But we show her and we highlight her as she is. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, actually. And it's cool. we made her look cool as one of the characters, a part of our set. And so we have somebody with vitiligo also, who is a, a public speaker and he's doing amazing things. So these are all things that we represent on purpose. And we wanted to do that because we're trying to break the stigma of in these spaces, when you have digital persons, you're always seeing, and, and at the beginning when I was testing these out, they were very Eurocentric. So it would take my image, make me an avatar, and it'd be like Giselle, white girl version. And, you know, I guess now I know what I look like as a white girl with these, with these, because <laughs> it totally straightened my hair. It made, it fared out my skin. It gave me a body shape that I don't have. And I'm like, look at the world. So we wanted to be very, you know, intentional in how we design people, how they look. Is it a person with dwarfism? And is it someone with muscular dystrophy? And is it someone with cerebral palsy? Is it someone who's shaped differently? What does that look like? Why can't we show that in digital form? And all our thing is about providing people the choice, the representation via choice. If you do wanna take on a different persona that doesn't look like you, great. But if you want to look like you in these digital forms, what we're doing is trying to push this envelope to make it normal. So that kids in the future when they play games, and they go into these virtual experiences, or they're able to pick an avatar for themselves at work, that it can represent them as they are, no matter what you look like, right? And that's that's what we were trying to do. Sorry for the noise here, I didn't mean to put that on there, but this is an experience where we were testing out um, a persona that can interact. So I told you in Viva Tech in Paris, this is the experience in which we were testing it out where you can see our characters. And if you were standing there in person, you'd see a life like form, like the size of what a human person would look like as an avatar um, in our spaces. And we've continued to create all these virtual experiences. 
So I want you in the next few slides, I'm going to say out loud for those of you who are not cited, I'm going to share with you some links and, and so that you can jot it down. And for those of you who are cited, go ahead and feel free to take a screenshot because when you get home or when you go to your rooms later, I want you to try out some of these experiences for yourself. All right, here's one. This is a metaverse environment that we've created and you can go in here, it is free. And the URL is bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y. Every URL that I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you three. They start with B-I-T dot L-Y, okay? The next one is, so you need to do forward slash 3CS9SLR. Three, cat, Sam, nine, Sam, lady, rug. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to come up with it out the fly. Okay. Hey. So when you get in there, you could try this in virtual reality. So you, you don't have to use virtual reality goggles, but if you have them, you can try it. But basically you'll be assigned an avatar um, in an experience, and then you'll go in and be able to go to our world and like just look around our avatars that we have on display in these places. Spoiler alert or caveat. We have been talking to these platform providers that we partner with and we're like, you need to be accessible and you need to have more representation. And if anything out of my talk today, intentional inclusion, this is what we're driving. It's not about just the cool experiences. We get to sit down with companies that are creating technology and we're pushing and saying, you need to do this and this is how to do it. And this is what you should be doing. And I'll share with you some of the tips that we've been giving them, but please note that even though we've been rebelliously infiltrating into these spaces, the intention is to change the way that technology is made in these spaces. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> so another one that you can experience is bit.ly. So B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash three J-I for U G Z bingo. All right, three Jack Igloo for uh, 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 unicorn Giselle with a G zebra. Okay, so there, there you have it right there. So augmented reality experiences. This one you should be able to click and view our characters. If you get to do this, please take a picture of yourself next to one of the characters and then send, like post it on LinkedIn or something or send it to me on LinkedIn. I'd love to see you with one of the characters. All right, so there we are with augmented reality. You can experience it on your own. Giselle, augmented reality, virtual reality, all this stuff is very visual. What happens to people who can't experience these things? Great question. So another one that we've been working on is being able to create audible experiences with these tools. So one of the things that we've actually done, and I'm gonna share with you some now ideas, um, and I'm open to yours. And these are prototypes that I'm talking about that we've already done and we just need funding to launch. So one of them has been um, creating audio descriptions over virtual or, 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 over, or these virtual experiences. So when I presented at a conference, I don't have it today to show you, but when we presented at a conference in Chicago recently, we had these cards that people were able to scan and they were able to bring up the virtual, the virtual experience with augmented reality. And if you couldn't see it, you would hear the description with, and we, we created like sound effects and music in the background, all kinds of more immersive experience where you're able to get a description of what the character looks like, what they're doing, and then you have that experience audibly instead of having to see it. And so if out here you're thinking about any augmented reality experiences, I encourage you to create audio descriptions and get really creative with immersive technologies of how you can maybe make sound spatial, like spatial sound experiences, so someone can feel like they're hearing it around the room, the surround sound, or everything like that, because people could still experience these things without having to see them. Okay, another one, uh, that was the mixed reality experience I told you about. I think this is another one. Check out bit.ly forward slash nifty collective, N-F-T-Y collective, nifty collective. So here's one of our characters swiveling around at a bus stop and it's just covered with different like uh, media images of you know, what nifty collective is and what we're all about. And uh, essentially we wanna keep building experiences like this. What we've also done, is we've partnered up and we've made a portal. So imagine that you're able to take out a mobile device 
and then a portal opens up, a virtual portal. You're able to physically walk into the portal or get into the portal, however you get into the portal. And you'll be able to like look around and experience characters popping up at you, you going up to a character and interacting with them and learning what their disability is, maybe learning what to say and not to say, you know, all kinds of things like that. We've done that. We've also created a game on a mobile device where you're able to control it accessibly. So you'll be able to fill, we have a, a fun theme with uh, ice cream cones. That's just a random fun theme about Nifty Collective is we like ice cream. And so we do everything with ice cream cones. And so one of the games is you're supposed to fill an ice cream cone and you can control it with your voice. If you, if you can only use that, you can control it by blinking. If you can only do that, you can move your head and nod it like that, or you can use your fingers to control that as well. So this is us being intentional as well with different experiences that should be accessible in different ways. Another parenthesis here, any type of technology, and this is what we're telling other providers as well, these platforms, you should make it flexible and personalized to the user. So whatever ways that someone can go and engage with that technology or that platform, they should have different access points in how to do that. Is it blinking? Is it nodding? Is it by voice? Is it, how is it? There are already technologies that exist today in gaming. I talked about haptics earlier, but there's also shoes that have sensors that if you're, you know, in a chair and, and or whatever the thing is that you can't, you know, experience in other ways, it actually gives you the effect that you're jumping or that something's vibrating or you're having all these different experiences. And what it is is bringing immersive, fun experiences to the gamer or to the individual. We've also partnered up with this avatar persona. And I'm sure, again, let me get a hand raised for the cringe here, but have you, have you heard of AI personas who are created? It's not a real person, it's an AI, and they might be a social media influencer and they go off the rails saying all kinds of craziness. Have you heard of that? That was a thing. There was Tay, Tay from, was it Microsoft? Tay's, Tay was like this virtual, um, AI person on Instagram and Twitter who was like, all, first it was all happy and sunshine, and then it was like, I'm gonna kill everybody and, and eat them and for breakfast. It was like, what's going on? Because AI was behind that and it went a little cuckoo. So uh, in these aspects, um, you, there's a good case to this too. I wanna share with you briefly. We're working with this organization based in um, APAC, and they have taken the voices and the images of real women with Down syndrome from, from that area. And they fed the algorithm and they fed this to show and come up with this persona who is not a real person, but it, it is this full 3D image of an, of an individual. And she now can answer questions based on AI as a person with Down syndrome would answer the question because the data was trained the data set was trained on a bunch of people with Down syndrome and how they would answer questions. I think that's pretty cool. Now let's, let's think about that in application in something like a metaverse. Imagine if, and we are working on this as well, if you're able to go into one of these experiences that I told you about and let the, let the platform know who you are. Hey, I'm a person who's blind. I'm a person who has dyslexia. I'm a person with autism. I'm a, a person with Down syndrome. And then the platform would adapt to you and would guide you through the experiences based on what you said that, that you are and would understand your profile. So it maybe will take away some of the sensory overload for one individual or for someone else, it would show text a certain way or for someone else, it would be complete audio descriptions going through the experience so that you could still enjoy. And that is the type of experiences you can have with augmented reality, with AI, with all of these things for good. All right. So this has been Nifty Collective, what you're seeing on the screen right now. We're just showing our, one of our characters in like a toy box display um, and he's there. That's Isaac Harvey again. If you want more information about us and our project and what we're doing, one of the big ways and what we're trying to do is really launch all of these experiences that we've created. It requires funding. And what we're wanting to do is really just kind of partner up with organizations who are like, I want to put my name on this game. Um, one last thing I'll mention to you is the Sandbox. So the Sandbox, again, is this virtual gaming platform. And what we're doing is trying to influence the way that they 
you know, deal with accessibility and show representation. The sandbox, uh, let me give you an idea of how much this stuff costs. All right, so this game development for us alone costs like uh, $75,000 to create the game alone in this space. Yeah, somebody was like, look. So that's why we need sponsors to be able to do that. But for the first time ever, we will create in that space because we've already created the game. And we have our Paralympian in there who you're able to go up to in his avatar and see him do his sports uh, in that space. People with disabilities will be going in there and playing games of all types, like sports, sports activities. They'll be able to learn of all types of different people with disabilities. Um, and it'll be very educational for the users. Sandbox has not allowed a lot of people to gain that like virtual land and space, only really big brands. But when they heard about Nifty Collective and that we're really trying to sh do something intentional about disability inclusion, they gave us space and they want to help us with that project. So we are going to be developing that and that's going to be coming out in the works. So what I'm telling you is this, like if, if anything, I hope that my talk today has been an example of how you can innovate intentionally. You can look at a space that was not originally designed for people with disabilities in mind, and you can get creative and infiltrate into those spaces to where eventually companies like Ericsson had us out and we were on stage talking amongst a plethora of people. And by the way, I was the only person of color in that room and I made it known. And I was like, yes, I did. I, I got off that stage and I was like, listen, I am here representing Nifty Collective and thank you for having me. And I really enjoy how you're talking about sustainability and you're talking about, you know, this, this topic and the other about how we need to monetize and what we need to do with extended reality and all of these things, because it's a major industry i'm telling you it's great and so all these people from around the world were gathered together and i'm sitting there on the stage sorry everyone but it is the truth with a lot of white men on this stage and it was great i love the people from erickson that they had me there and they did it on purpose because they wanted to include something different so i commend them for that but i let the audience know like, one of these things just doesn't belong here. i was like do you notice do you notice what's happening here i'm the only person talking about disability inclusion and i'm the only black woman in this room and that needs to change because if we're going to design with disability inclusion and all types of inclusion in mind, you have to have the people there present that are influencing and that come from that lived experience to be able to do something different. So in conclusion, thank you so much for listening today. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope you enjoy some of these experiences. I want to hear your feedback. I want to hear your ideas of what we can do because we have the ear of technology companies that are creating these things. We've also sat down with the creator of Second Life, who was the very originator of, uh, of the metaverse. We're actually friends. I've met with him several times and we're trying to think through ways in which we can make a difference in these spaces. So please bring your, your feedback, your ideas, your comments, and just know that out there in the weird world of the metaverse and Web3 and extended reality, there's this Afro-Latina girl out here who has dyslexia and is trying to make a difference in this space. And I'm, I'm open to take you all with me on the journey. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Sharon, you want me to say, Sharon, what you want me to do? You gotta get up, Sharon. Sharon. Oh, that's right, questions. I'd love that. Please do. Okay, Sharon, we can take a couple questions or comments, please. Yeah, we got some in the room right now, so then we'll take some of the chats as well. So you help me moderate that. But yes, pink, the pink shirt. The they were what? They weren't working. Oh, I'm gonna have to follow up on that. I'll follow up on that. I promise. I'll get it to Sharon. Are they? It may have been case sensitive, and I may have put it all in caps, but it may have been case sensitive. So let's try that. Yes, I love it. Perfect. We'll get that going. I'll share it with Sharon afterwards. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, what kind of education oh. would you uh, need to find to get into that? So, I mean, working with individuals, with youth with disabilities, and you're trying to help them and ensure that they have a better, you know, opportunity for their success in their future. Uh, what kind of education would you request for them to kind of get into to be able yeah. to, great, great to be an individual on the stage um, up there to help you out? Like, 
Yeah, spatial computing is really great to learn. The world of spatial computing encompasses things like augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, and artificial intelligence. So if you're gonna get a basic understanding of that, and then I would encourage people, if you wanna kind of design some of this, learn 3D design. 3D designs there, and there's so many really cool resources that exist today already, open source, out there for free, that people can really learn. I self-taught and designed a lot of these, these experiences, and then I worked with development teams from around the world who have been enabling us to have these experiences. So you don't have to know it all to get into it. Anyone from the, anyone else? Yes. Hi, I was just wondering, are you including um, kids and teens in this whole process? Because this is fantastic. And I'm thinking about my son, I'm going to go show it to him. And I'm, lots of things I, I think are great. He's like, oh, we're already doing that, mom. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Really? So I was yeah, just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, we we started off with adults because this Nifty Collective, they gave us permission to be able to use their images and their personas to be able to do this. But our intention is to create these games and these all these filters and these things that I discussed so that kids can also go in there and play them and learn from them as well. So, yes, and we will eventually kind of that's that's the plan too to include children and teens. Giselle, we have a couple from chat. Have you looked into Microsoft HoloLens as a way to recreate virtual worlds and augmented? No, but thank you for the suggestion. And I have a friend at Microsoft who, who uh, helped create the Xbox and he's getting me in there to have some conversations. Question from the speaker. You mentioned decentralization. Y'all making me read too. I told you I'm dyslexic. Centralization and Web3 changing ownership of our media. Do you have thoughts? Uh, it's been talked about a lot in the disability community. Must I represent real change in your opinion? I'd have to look into that. I'm not sure. I need to look into that, Samuel. Thank you for that question. The next one's about where to find updates to say keep um, up with the progress. One of the so things that we want to do is go, you can follow us online and, and through our social media, but we also want to make sure that we are including people with disabilities into these spaces so they could test a lot of this and provide us feedback along the way. All right, cool. Anybody else? Last question. Oh yeah, one more and we're done. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you again. Have a great one, thank you. <laughs>